Hi, Terry. Hey. Okay. All right. I am recording tonight's meeting. Very good. Welcome to the April 27th meeting of the Boulder Housing Advisory Board. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. I'm Michael Luchese, the chair of the board, and uh, take roll call. So, um, Juliet uh, Boone. Hello. You can see you're here. Uh, uh, Philip Ogren, one of our newer members. Here. Here. Julianne Ramsey, officially a member of HAB now, I believe. Hi. Uh, Jennifer Livovich. Hello. Um, Terry Pamos. You're here. Hey, Terry. And Danny hey. Ter Teodoro. Danny's connecting now. Oh, Danny's connecting, great. Well, we not only have a quorum, then I think we have full attendance. That's wonderful. Thank you all for making the time to be here tonight. Fantastic. Hello. Danny, may I count you in? I am in. Okay, Danny, welcome. Great to see you back. Uh, okay, we have, as I said, we have full attendance here. And uh, again, we'll welcome our newest uh, board members, uh, Philip Ogren, who attended as a member last month. And Julianne Ramsey is officially a member now. Do you want to say hi, Julianne, and introduce yourself a little more? Yeah, hi. I guess I introduced myself a little bit during the last meeting, but there's a few new people here, too. Um, my name is Julianne Ramsey, and I'm officially a board member as of tonight. I'm a student at CU studying environmental design, and I'm really interested in housing and urban planning, and I'm happy to be here. Great. Okay. And Philip, you introduced yourself last month, but not everybody was here. You want to say hi again? Hello, I'm Philip. Um, <clears throat> I uh, have been passionate about housing for quite a while. I, I um, I've dabbled in a bunch of things around, around housing. I, I've campaigned with Bedrooms Are For People, and um, I uh, host a podcast that's kind of dormant at the moment called Sharing Boulder. And... Um, I've blogged about housing in the past too. And yeah, I'm just really excited to be uh, in this conversation with everyone here. Great. Well, I look forward to both of you being very um, active uh, members. Um, okay, uh, agenda review. We have a really interesting agenda tonight. We'll be approving the minutes first. That's pretty routine. We have, I believe, at least one guest who, uh, for public participation, for potential item, uh, comment. That's item number five. Uh, and then uh, a really big one that we've been working on for a long time is uh, our final review with a potential recommendation on the East Boulder subcommunity plan, which we did a 90% review of uh, last month. That's item six, um, and it is an action item. Number seven, madams from the board will be uh, uh, electing a chair and a vice chair uh, for the coming year. And we will also be reviewing the uh, city council priorities related to housing. And I did send out a memo about this, just really trying to set the scene. So we were prepared to talk about that. I hope it wasn't too opinionated. I was really just trying to state the issues so we could uh, deal with them in a timely uh, manner. Uh, item eight, uh, Madam matters from staff, the affordable housing uh, dashboard update. Nine is a, a meeting debrief and calendar check. So we know we're reading next and then we will try to adjourn no later than uh, 9 p.m. Um, so um, I believe you've all had a chance to review the minutes. Do I hear a motion on approval of March 30th minutes? I move to approve. Great, any seconds? Great, uh, all in favor, aye. Okay, looks like the minutes are unanimously approved. I got that right. Um, do we have members, a member or members of the public who would like to take three minutes to comment to the board? Well, you have a member, yes. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, Mark Fear. welcome. Howdy. Um, I first wanna say that uh, I, I know that you all have a lot on your plate. You're getting a lot of flack for the East Community sub plan going on right now. So like any good, uh, effective uh, board, you all are um, getting criticized <laughs> because you're doing your work. So I just want to recognize that and I appreciate you doing your work. I'm here specifically as I, I was here 
back in the fall, I believe, and I met with a few of you back in December um, on the issue of rent control. And um, um, specifically, well, very specifically on rent control, but my, I'm urging you all to please address the issues of the rental housing market. Uh, and I'm glad to see you have at least one, if not two people on, on HAB who are, now, who are renters. Uh, that's really good. Uh, and I appreciate seeing that voice because it's often way too absent from public discussion and the narrative on affordable housing, which as we all know, covers, uh, well, 52% of the Boulder's population are renters. So I, I really want to urge the uh, HAB to address this specific segment. And I, I realize you are doing it to some extent with affordable housing, um, but I would really like to urge, if not encourage, if not push you all to pay more attention to the specific existing rental market. I know you're working on new units, but the existing unit is where most low-income people exist and they really could use your help given the absolutely obscene rents that we are all facing uh, at this point. I feel you have a, a strong role to play in advising the city council in terms of a number of tenant issues that have been unaddressed up to this point. Um, and I'm gonna run out of time like I did last time. So uh, I don't have the time and I wish I could have a longer period of time to, to see you or help you address that segment of existing housing and how important it is uh, for Boulder to recognize that this is where people live and we need help. That segment really needs help. Rent control obviously is one of the biggest uh, things that, one of the biggest uh, uh, dynamics that could make a huge difference to the most number of people. Uh, and I just would like to see HAB address that issue in some meaningful way. Uh, of course, understanding, we all understand it is uh, illegal in the state of Colorado, but there is growing pressure on all cities to address and do something significant uh, about rental prices for existing housing. And I've run out of time and I'll just have to leave it there. Okay, Mark. Um, thank you for being here and for commenting. Um, and uh, I will tell you in all honesty that rent control is not on our work plan for this year. Um, unfortunately, there are just many, many competing uh, difficult issues. Um, but I would love to hear from you as to uh, what your conversations on this topic have been, especially if you've been able to speak with any of our elected officials or policymakers, like specifically, what does this look like? And are you getting any encouragement that Boulder might possibly act on something related to rent control? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just put something in the chat because I write a column for the Boulder Weekly on this issue, a bi, -column, a bi weekly column, uh, and I just put it in the chat, the last four columns that I've written on this issue that would give you some good background. Okay. Well, that would work for me. I promise I will read them. I haven't yet. Um, does anyone from the board have any questions for Mr. Fear? Any other comments on this topic? I'm copying the links down and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read them. So thank you for sharing. I, I have a question, Mark. I'm, I'm not an expert in rent control. Um, but it sounds like you've done a, a ton of research on it. And I was curious in cities where uh, you've seen rent control effective, do property owners also get some kind of relief when it comes to property tax increases and, and expenses that they might incur um, on the ownership side so that uh, they can effectively um, maintain rent control without losing, uh, you know, operating at a loss. Uh, Juliet, I appreciate you asking that question. And it's, it's so, there's so much to the subject that uh, we could easily take an hour, hour and a half on this. But the real quick answer is some of that answers are in my columns that I'm writing. I'm giving detailed information, including 
looking at the cities that have it. Almost 200 cities around the country have rent control and it's working uh, in those cities and more cities are looking at trying to get it. Um, so the really quick answer, I'm trying to be as direct as possible, those costs, including taxes, maintenance, repairs, all of those things are built into the rents already. So they're there um, and they're addressed. Uh, and when people are, uh, in most cities allow rent increases uh, to include any increased cost like higher taxes or being able to do repairs and maintenance, uh, they are able to pass those costs on in uh, reasonable rent increases. Rent control doesn't stop rent from going up. It just means it has to be reasonable increases. Thank you. So, Mark, I guess one of the things I just throw at you, and I mean, this is, you know, probably not the forum for it, but I just, you know, the, the concern of rent control has always been, on top of everything else, the... Uh, uh, the town of Telluride case and, and you know, where the, yes. the Supreme Court upheld the prohibition on rent control, um, which, you know, originated statutorily, and I know that can be modified, but it, it, it creates quite a problem even for, um, you know, tangential rent control or, you know, things like AMI restrictions in the state of Colorado. So, um, you know, I know that that's, that's always, you know, been my understanding that it's a, it's a really uh, tough nut to, to crack because of, because of that Supreme court case and, um, you know, related statutes to it. And as far as I know, that's still, um, it still seems to be the, the big obstacle that we face for almost everything. Yes, you're right. It's precedent, but also that was decided 20 years ago and there's a completely new group on the Colorado Supreme court. And I feel pretty confident given the environment of incredibly, high rents right now that the, uh, the current Colorado Supreme Court would make a different decision than it made 20 years ago when it was a very different rental environment. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Well, I agree it is a really important issue and I wanna thank you for keeping it in our attention and. Um, you know, right now there's a, a bit of a deadlock with statutory issues in the state. But uh, it's something we should be keeping an eye on. Um, I think we're all aware that our <clears throat> the outcome of our retreat was to focus on missing middle housing in 2022, which I think is pretty well aligned with council priorities and city priorities now. Unfortunately, housing is such a big issue, it's just impossible to attack every, every angle of it at the same time. But uh, thank you again for your comments. And once again, any other comments on this issue or questions for our guests? Thanks for considering it. Well, I'll read your columns also, thank you. Um, okay, uh, matters from the council, item six, um, East Boulder subcommunity plan. We did receive the updated draft uh, just the other day. I looked through it uh, today. Um, I, I would love to, um, you know, it's, it's a little hard to tell if it's different from the 90% version <laughs> that we saw last time. Uh, I didn't have time to compare them side by side, but I wonder if anybody has done that analysis and has any, any comment on, uh, I know some folks commented uh, to Kathleen King on elements of the plan. And if you want to review any of your comments on that, we can talk about that as well. But this is an action item, so uh, we can have as much discussion about it as you'd like. Um, who would like to start? I have a question, Michael. Yeah, you know, Terry, please. For Jay, um, I don't know if everybody's read the news, but recently an announcement was made um, that a big biotech real estate investment group bought basically a million square feet of, of commercial space. And I believe most of it is in East Boulder, if not all of it. And uh, my question to Jay is, is, uh, has anybody looked at where these buildings are compared to the East Boulder subcommunity plan? Are they all within the East Boulder subcommunity plan? Do we know that? That's the biggest deal in the state of Colorado ever. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I, um, I don't know the details, like how much is in the East Boulder subcommunity plan area. Um, but that's 
I'm not, I'm not entirely sure it would have a significant impact on the plan. I mean, so think about the East Boulder subcommunity plan. I mean, it's, it's one level down from the comprehensive plan. It's really meant as a very long-term vision document. Um, and, but I agree. I mean, it, that, that's a pretty big game changer if you have a single property owner um, in that area. And whether or not they embrace the East Boulder subcommunity plan, I think will be a big factor in how well and how quickly it gets implemented, so. But yeah, sorry, I don't have more. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm guessing here, this, you know, I haven't studied a map and looked at the buildings that were just recently purchased and, and where they factor in, but I'm I'm 90% sure they're all out there. They're all in the between Arapaho and, and Iris and east of 47th and et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure I'm 90% I'm sure all of them are out there. That, that's a huge deal. Somebody came and paid five, $500 million. I mean, this is a big thing. And and and, uh, and and I don't know what their plans are. I don't know if anybody knows what their plans are, but uh, it seems to be that their plans are to keep those buildings office buildings and places where people go to work. Um, and that impacts the ability to redevelop them, which is what the East Florida Subcommunity Plan is talking about, redeveloping all those buildings up there, which my personal opinion is great idea. Love to see something other than 20 and 30 year old office buildings, 40, 50 year old office buildings and parking lots out there. I would love to see the plan come to fruition, but this is like the biggest elephant in the room ever, um, kind of having a huge say in what happens out there now. So I just was wondering if that's, I mean, this is breaking news. This is literally a week old. So it just needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, that's a great point. Terry, go ahead, Danny. Uh, Terry, I'd say probably, uh, I, I don't know where they are either, but you know, to the extent that there's um, residual properties that are not part of that purchase, um, which I imagine there's at least, you know, some percentage, um, maybe a lot of aspects of this plan then allow them, afford them the flexibility to be kind of outside of whatever the, the, the use and development plan is for, for that company and the, uh, all the properties they purchase. It, it absolutely could be. But what happens is we all know when you're trying to do a master plan, you know, you need some momentum, right? You need a bunch of property yeah. owners somebody to consolidate a whole block or an area to get it going doing it onesie twosie is harder it's just harder yeah. it's not impossible it's just more difficult um so anyway that's, that's just a side note otherwise i love the plan for what it's worth i think it's great i'm all for it let's let's take east boulder and make it much nicer than it is now yeah i i think you are right terry that the entirety of that office park is in the district um actually uh I don't know, there can be pluses and minuses. There is consolidation of ownership there. We just don't know anything about the new owners. The company that sold it, you know, has been known to do some pretty progressive things with real estate. So I almost yeah. wish they had held it. And, you know, I met Danny out there just the other day and, you know, they're already starting to introduce some mixed use in the form of breweries and coffee shops. So it's it's not like this blank wasteland so much when you go out there, there's oh, a no, few other things to do and maybe that you know that's not housing but it's a trend towards mixed use um uh mark when he commented and talked about criticism of the plan i wanted to address that a little bit i think it's a good plan i <clears throat> and i'm impressed with the work the city has done um there has been some criticism that about um adding jobs that, that would uh, continue to exacerbate the jobs housing imbalance in boulder um, I, you know, I, I can see some logic to that, but it doesn't really fly for me personally. Um, there actually are about, I think, 10,000 jobs in that area already and virtually no housing. So the imbalance to me is there's no housing. You know, there's 10,000 people coming into Boulder that have no place to live near their, their workplace. And uh, I can see, you know, the plan is clearly uh, uh, stage to help address that over, over time. Um, and, uh, you know, given the fact that, that there's fairly low FV, FAR and a lot of parking lots and room for growth that inevitably will include some more jobs too. So um, I just wanted to address that criticism. I don't uh, personally agree with it, but, you know, those are the types of discussions that are going on out there about the East Boulder subcommunity plan. Couldn't agree with you more, Michael. And, and on that note, my vision is keep the jobs and add housing, right? Well, that's that's what the plan is trying to do. Exactly, exactly, right. which I think is great. 
And Danny. And, I, and I'd say I, I love the plan. I've been supportive of it as it's as it's uh, developed and, and I think kind of solidified and improved. You know, this is we've had a chance to take a look at it um, several times now. And, uh, you know, in terms of some of the critiques, I'd, I'd probably echo um, Michael, Terry, both of what you said. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we, we seem to be possibly at the precipice of uh, uh, some sort of economic downturn. And, and, and you know, uh, jobs are never a bad thing. I'm, I'm you know, uh, I, lived, I lived through 2008 through 2012 and, you know, jobs were a great thing back then. And so, you know, I think, I think the whole notion of trying to achieve that balance and have the most uh, um, pragmatic and uh, uh, effective vision for an area that doesn't just leave it where it is, where it's kind of kind of languishing and, and um, you know, uh, somewhat of a somewhat of somewhat of a neutral perspective, or just kind of languishing. And, and you know, the the structure of the past is uh, not the answer. And to try to make these improvements, and it's a vision plan. Um, and so, you know, with any with any sort of vision plan or master plan, there's there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of hits and a lot of misses and a lot of uh, micro adjustments that go on over time. But I think this is a terrific first start. I think it's a, a really good effort at uh, re-envisioning the community and I'm very supportive of it. Thanks, Danny. Um, others, please comment. Philip, you had some back and forth with Kathleen, didn't you, about the plan? I did. Um, unfortunately, um, I have I have some comments from her that I haven't had a chance to read yet. Um, I need to get into a better habit of uh, checking the email I set up for uh, for for all this activity. Um, but um, yeah, I I I just I just want to say that um, uh, um, I, I I'm. Uh, <laughs> My brain kind of goes in a lot of directions. Um, I, I, um, every time I read through it, I have new ideas about what I'd like to see in East Boulder. Uh, it's, it, and you know, it probably doesn't matter what kind of new ideas I might come up with uh, this evening. Uh, the, um, but, but I'm also just totally impressed by all the care and the research and the work that's been done to put this together. And it's really fun to read and I'm excited about, um, you know, that there's, there's nice pictures in it and there's great ideas about walkable neighborhoods. And man, I just hope that we have a lot more walkable neighborhoods in Boulder and um, housing close to work and uh, close to jobs. I, I love jobs too. I, I, um, I'm not an equity millionaire and I can't, I can't go with, live in Boulder without having a job. And um, I'm not, I'm not really interested in trying to squeeze jobs out of Boulder so that, you know, uh, <laughs> anyways, that's the sort of my point of view. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm all for uh, recommending it to city council if that's, if that's the implied question. I don't know if, is, is that the explicit question? Actually? Uh, well, uh, right now we're just commenting. I think when yeah. we okay. make a recommendation, right. we'll, okay. you know, craft some wording around that and, and uh, take a vote on it, but um, you know, open for just commenting. I appreciate the fact that you got into the an issue that this board is considered, which is how does housing availability and housing type affect the potential um, population of Boulder Public Schools. And um, it, you know, Kathleen provided some stats about you know what schools would be available to people who lived in that area if they wanted to do their local school. Um, the ones you mentioned are not at capacity at all. They could use more students. Um, and um, uh, so I thought she was responsive on that point. <clears throat> um, whether the type of housing that could be provided there is the type of housing that families would be attracted to is something that you know could be decided much farther down the road. Um, and I've already commented on this, but this plan is very aspirational, almost to the point of being idealistic. And, um, you know, there have been concern raised, I think, by the city's own consultants that there could be some, a lot of economic reality uh, ahead uh, facing uh, implementation of many of these ideas. You know, pub, privately owned public space would be an example of that. Uh, our, our owners motivated to redevelop properties that are already occupied and cash flowing. There's 
all kinds of issues like that ahead that, you know, no matter what we recommend, um, it wouldn't be us, up to us to decide them. So I think we're really going to be voting on the, the vision and whether we think it's a good direction to try to follow. Um, other comments, please. I think what you just said is great. It is a great thing to like try and follow. I think it might be a little bit ambitious in terms of like the amount of equity it's trying to create because it is bolder and things are getting more expensive. Um, but I do like the room that they left for equity, especially I was looking at page, what was it? 76, they talked about um, arts and culture of the district and including like even subsidized art studio space, which is, which is great. So I appreciate like the room they left for affordable housing. And um, yeah, they just thought of a lot of different examples of equity that could be included. I just hope that they're all attainable, especially by the time that this plan comes to fruition. Good comment. And it is um, kind of a new direction for the city to be embracing uh, arts and culture as a, as a key element of economic vitality, which I think is an incredibly uh, positive direction. Juliet, what do you think? Well, I guess we've been talking about it for a long time uh, and we've seen all the iterations and I, I think we should vote or re recommend. I don't have anything else to add or, or comments or um, I think everyone's said it all already. Okay, I agree with you, but you know, we want to be sure that uh, nothing gets unspoken before we do we do vote on it. Um, Jennifer, same question for you or your cat. Uh, do you have anything to add? <laughs> by the way, I apologize for eating my soup, but I will fall down on my computer keyboard if I don't eat by nine o'clock. Okay, Jennifer's cat seems to really like the plan. There's lots of feline uh, amenities in it, and uh, so that's good. Um, well, I think the motion on this would be pretty simpler. Simple. We could just um, say we approve. We like this plan. We recommend it to City Council for adoption. Does it seem sufficient, or do we need to make something more detailed than that? Our names are already on it, Michael. Like we've adopted it. Like we've endorsed it in case you didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah, that was a 90%. Foregone so conclusion. Yeah. We still have to make a, I did notice that. It's not a gotcha. Uh, we still have to make recommendations. So I guess we have to be recommending something. Uh, would we like to recommend this plan for adoption by city council? And, and just add planning board in there too. And planning board, sorry. Oh yeah, those guys and women. <laughs> I, th I think uh, simplicity works well here. I think just saying that, you know, we support it um, and we recommend it for adoption is, you know, just that we support it. Hopefully if we support it unanimously, which it sounds like, probably say it that way. And, um, and that we uh, um, are appreciative of all the effort that went into it. And we um, recommend adoption by city council. That would be my suggestion. I guess okay, I'll barrister, just uh, make a motion with the wording and uh, we'll, we'll move on from there. Okay, I, I'd like to move that we uh, um, uh, take a vote to state that we um, uh, unanimously support the plan and uh, we appreciate the um, effort and community input that went into it and we would recommend it for adoption by the planning board and city council. Very good, do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion does indeed pass unanimously, which is good because we you know it's in the language of the motion. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Dan, sorry, Danny, can you repeat that for me so that I can um send that? Uh, to uh, okay. Uh the uh housing advisory board uh unanimously supports the plan, um uh, appreciates uh all the staff effort and community input that went into the plan and recommends uh, adoption by the planning board and city council accordingly. There's something like that. That's similar to what I said the first time. Great. Say, what if I don't like the new wording? 
Um, Perfect. Perfect. Have at it. <laughs> that sounds good to me. I don't think we need to vote on it again. Um, so my, I will send this to Kathleen and she can include it in the memo. But my recommendation would be, and I'll um, copy the board as well, but my recommendation would be for Michael to send an email to planning board and city council with that language. Once yeah. we have written down, sure. Yeah. That's great. Do that okay. either tonight or tomorrow or in the next couple of days. Well, thank you all. This is really important stuff and I appreciate your careful consideration of all these issues. Uh, we can go on to item seven matters from the board, pretty much on time. <clears throat> this is a big one. It's election time. And um, let's see, remind me procedurally how we get this started, Jay. I nominate Michael to be chair. I second. Uh, all in favor? I'm going to vote for myself. What the hell? <laughs> I think Michael, I had something for this. I have wait, to wait. Say, I'm sorry, did somebody else get a chance to be nominated? I don't want to foreclose no, anything. No, no, no. I have to, I have to say something. This this was crafty, I think, or maybe it's not that crafty. But sure. But but, but of, of, of of I don't know how many years I've been on this board and many other boards and how many chairs we've had. And all due respect to the past chairs, they were great and all. But but you are the, the Michael Jordan of chairs for this board. <laughs> The, the goat, the goat, the greatest of all time. So I just had to say wow. that we all unanimously approve you as the chair because I really appreciate you being the chair and the meetings have been great and everything's been so much better since you're doing what you do. So so Michael Lucchesi can be Michael Jordan for just this purpose and, and we can we can vote on it. <laughs> I, I, I second the rename. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can see the tears running down my. <laughs> I thought I thought that was soup. My beard is now sodden with them. And... I thought it was your soup. <laughs> <laughs> well, I squeeze that out later. <laughs> um, that's great. Thank you so much. I wasn't fishing for any compliments or even to be reelected, but now that I'm reelected, I appreciate it. Um, uh, are we done, or do we actually vote yet? We're voting now. We're voting. Yes. Who seconded it? All in favor. Today. All favor. Okay, let it be known that uh, the Michael Jordan of chairs of half has been unanimously reelected, even though I can't jump. <laughs> no so thank you all. Thank now you. who wants to be vice chair? Who nominates who for vice chair? Danny, are I'm you vice nominee. chair now? I'm vice chair now. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm willing, anyone um, else? I'm, I'm right. happy to re to re uh, renew or whatever is vice nominate chair. Danny. I nominate Danny for vice chair. Second. A second. Any other You're nominations? Tipping, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Danny has been the greatest Fair vice enough. chair. He's like the you know, Steph good. Curry of vice chairs. Uh, anybody else uh, have a nomination for vice chair? All in favor of keeping the status quo, say aye. Or aye. Hey. Danny, congratulations, man. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, next item is uh, kind of revisiting something we just started last, and this is just a discussion. It's not an action item, but I thought it'd be valuable to kind of compare our goals to city councils from the uh, their their uh, retreat discussion. Uh, and uh, I did send you all. A memo the other day to just kind of grease the wheels on this uh, and um, you know my my analysis was we really had three issues that we could focus on that would be well aligned with council and they'd welcome our input but that's really just for discussion uh, I'm up open to hearing anyone's thoughts on these issues, it's um, again, it's, it's it's not an action item, but it should probably lead to some action, certainly before September when the council uh, is scheduled to have a study session on housing issues, which I believe will focus on this missing middle issue that is important to all of us. So I'll open it up. Michael, is it possible? Is it is it possible to put those up on the? You know what I mean. Uh, can I share my? Not advanced enough to open an email and do this at the same time. I don't have that, but yeah, you should be able to share your screen. Okay, 
Uh, hold on a second. Uh, share screen, share screen. I, I read, read your memo and I liked it. I just, uh, I can't get it on my oh, yeah, deal. Share screen as well. Happy to do it as well, Michael, if you want. No, I, I should be coming up. I don't do as many Zoom calls as I used to. Aha, there it is. Good work. Yeah. Haven't lost a 25 foot jumper yet. There you go. <laughs> So yeah, oh, it's, it's <laughs> I'm just going to just stomp that metaphor into the ground. Uh, the three issues I personally picked to focus on were ADUs, planning reserve, and transit village or Boulder uh, Junction. Um, so I guess the first question would be, are those the three we want to focus on that have the most potential for us to make recommendations that could be meaningful? Uh, am I leaving something out? Am I missing something? And, uh, you know, there were other uh, focus areas that came out of the council priorities. So, um, we, do how, how granular do we want to get? Do we just want to say yes, no, I don't like this because of that? Because we could talk about these for hours, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, I, I'd love to, some advice on how to structure the conversation because like with anything with housing, it could turn to a death march. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, okay. I'll, we just want to talk about these three and say we like this, don't like that, and go through everybody. Is that maybe the easiest thing to do? Or? I think what we really, rather than getting into the, the issues of each one, maybe we should talk about how we can make an impact. Um, you know, what we've heard about planning reserve is there's a lot of technical work that needs to happen before much of that or any of it can be opened up for future development. And a lot of that is related to the Boulder Valley comp plan, which only comes up every five years. So Jay, can you just kind of verify that I'm not going off on that and that's an accurate statement? Um, absolutely, and I was I was gonna mention that as well. I mean, it's, so it, just initiating the consultant work to do the infrastructure analysis to understand if we could possibly, or efficiently and uh, serve that area with infrastructure. Um, someone wouldn't be, a consulting team wouldn't even be hired until this fall at the very earliest, um, which means that that work wouldn't even, you wouldn't even have a baseline of information until next year. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's, a, it's still a big question of what, what is HAB's role? Um, I, I know you had talked earlier about wanting to help council to framing the issues, but I would just ask, have to think through. It's like, well, what is it specifically about these different topics mm -hmm. to address? Danny. So, I have a question. <clears throat> so in terms of that particular area, and, and, and I think there's two things here. There's the specifics of that area. And then there's also some of the conceptual notions of what we're doing with part of that. And, and, and I guess the big thing, and this is, this is something I, I, I see popping up in community by community, which is, um, you know, uh, open space and the notion of open space of, you know, the open space means so many different things, but the notion of open space being potential areas for housing and affordable housing, you know, and I think um, that, that there was a lot of angst even over in CU South, kind of um, my neck of the woods over a lot of that. And so my question would be, what's the legal status of that area now? Because um, I think that plays a big role in it. And I think then the other question is, you know, what would our role be in looking at these areas that are maybe slated or designated for different uses and saying, maybe this is something that should be addressed as housing, you know? So I know it's a multi-part question, but I guess the whole notion is uh, this is a model, you know, what are we looking, uh, what is this now and what would it be? And is that, cause I think that helps answer the question of whether or not it's something that we should be um, stepping into as, as HAB as a housing advisory board. Well, if I may, this, this is kind of what I was talking about. Do we want to get into the details of each one of these topics or right. do we just kind of say, yes, Michael, we like these topics or, I mean, I'm a good either way. I just want to understand so I can prepare my comments. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that occurred to me uh, as we're starting to frame this is, you know, would it be, uh, should we keep it at a pretty high level and, make a recommendation to the council that they hire that consultant and get the ball rolling, you know, don't, don't delay. I mean, cause it, 
it takes a long time to uh, affect the process. Um, you know, that doesn't really get into any policies. It just sort of says, let's start the process. Right. And I guess, my, so my point is that depending on what that area is right now, um, really kind of helps answer the question, at least for me, of what kind of hornet's nest we're looking at with it and whether or not that's something to even say, because consultants aren't cheap last I looked, right, to say, do we not touch this and we let that be something that, you know, we revisit, revisit once there's a policy decision that's made regarding um, how to address those kinds of areas or, you know, is it something that we want to jump into the fray now on, you know? Sounds like there's some chicken and egg issues. Right. Um, another thing that occurs to me is, you know, maybe the uh, consultant, uh, Philip's got a, got a comment, which is probably better than mine, so I'm going to yield to Philip. Go ahead. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off. That's what the raise no, is. That's okay. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. Um, so uh, my, my high level comment about planning reserve this is this is not an area that i know well so i i don't have deep intuitions about it um but uh you know one one of the roles that we could play in this if if it is like a um a political uh hot potato or a hornet's nest um one of the things we might do is is uh promote a vision of what it could be that that would be a positive uh, statement of the good that could come out of um, developing it. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I have I have notions of swinging for the fences fences when it comes to to promoting visions of of what could be. I mean, there's there's so many ways to make beautiful neighborhoods that are compelling and irresistible that that people want more of. Um, and so. Um, Anyways, uh, and and I would love to like dive into like the immediate vision I have of of what of what I'd like to see in Boulder. Uh, but uh, so let me know if you want me to do that. <laughs> yeah, and I can provide a little bit of a response to Danny's question. Sure. And so just a little bit more context: the, the planning reserve is pretty well. Well, you're you muted yourself, Jay. <laughs> There you oh, go. I, I did that. Yeah. Um, so as I, like I was, so the planning reserve, um, I would say, is really well spelled out in our comprehensive plan. So you know we have area one, the city limits services are provided. We have area two, which says we can annex those areas. Um, we and we have the ability to serve them with um, utilities, and then we have area three, which is basically out, off limits except for the planning reserve. So the planning reserve is sort of that next step, right? So assuming that we can provide services, that is intended to be within city boundaries. It's not intended to be county lands. It's not intended to be open space. Um, it is set aside for future urbanization. So that said, there's a strong policy basis for it, but there are always challenges even in area two where we can already, already annex. So Hogan Pancos, Twin Lakes, um, you know, Palo Park, um, CU South. So it's, it, it is going to be a hornet's nest regardless and a large community political discussion. Um, but I think what council has signaled is we, we need to start having that conversation. So Jay, I think that that's really, really helpful because for, for me, to the extent that, um, you know, our, our recommendation would be like, we, something along the lines and i think um going kind of with you know terry's question i think addressing these things uh and philip kind of what you were saying in a little bit of a more of broader broader brush strokes and saying that you know we believe um the timing is probably right to start exploring um you know the potential for uh um increasing affordable housing in all these areas including area three planning reserve and whatever um, initial consultant analysis for things like infrastructure um, would really make a lot of sense to us. So, something along those lines, I think I could be supportive of in terms of what we're talking about doing here. Um, you know, it does seem like there's going to be a lot of necessary steps in the process. And I wouldn't want to have to, I, I don't want us to think we're like leapfrogging over, 
area too, for some reason. But I think that, you know, saying that we encourage, at least saying that we encourage um, expanding the possibility for housing, because obviously we all know that we're kind of squeezed in by the, by the present limits is, is, you know, something I could be supportive of as long as it's not open space that we're building on. Right. So actual legal open space. So that's, that's the reason I was asking. Thank you, Danny. Um, other comments? Well, I'm going to follow up on what Philip said because I really liked his direction. Um, I feel like if we're going to make a recommendation to council, and we should, it should be high level, but maybe um, suggesting a more specific direction. Uh, you know, uh, when I think of like the consultant work in an early phase of a project, I think of there a lot of analysis, and I, it would be great if this uh, included some of that visioning of like what this can be, and help people imagine what it would look like, um, <clears throat> how it would help Boulder, and how it would solve or at least address specific housing issues. So, I would favor a recommendation that had. I mean, really, it would be urging them to move forward and don't delay. You know, if you're going to hire a consultant, get it started, but then giving them some guidelines on what that consultant would actually uh, do and how that might um, get the community more on board with a future vision for the planning reserve. Sounds good. Um, can we put that in the agenda for the next meeting? I would love to, I don't, I don't think we're ready to tease out a recommendation now, but next month. Okay. Um, anything else on planning reserve before we talk about um, ADUs? If I wanted to see where the, the area in question is, the 500 acres, um, where would I go to see a map? Drive out to the corner of 28th and J and look north and east. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, the, be the best place to go is the our comprehensive plan. So there's, yeah. there's, an, there's, okay. there's an Airbnb <laughs> available in one of those prairie dog colonies, so you can really check it out. <laughs> Terry, well, Terry, you'll learn you'll learn soon enough that I don't drive anywhere. <laughs> oh well, you can, you can walk it or, or, or ride a bike. You can start you can on the corner of 28th and J. And ride your bike north to Gateway Park, although it's called something different now, I think. And it's everything to the right. <laughs> right. Um, are we ready to have a similar conversation about ADUs? I think that was a productive start on a big issue. So thank you. I think, are we talking or? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody knows my opinion on ADUs. To me, ADUs and tiny homes are somewhat synonymous and I'm all for making it easier to have them and have more of them. And there should be one in every backyard in town. Which is not legal today. No, that's an exaggeration clearly, but we should make it easier to, to have ADUs in, 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 on properties in Boulder. In my opinion, as I've said a thousand times, it's the easiest way to get reasonably priced housing without having to subdivide any new lots or create any more land. We can just use the lots and the land we have and the streets that we have and the utilities that we have and the schools and the police we have and add rooftops, bedrooms and kitchens. We don't even need bedrooms, just bathrooms, kitchens and living areas uh, in, in thousands and thousands of lots in this town. And we should make that as easy as possible to happen. And I'll, I'll, follow up on that and say I absolutely agree and and you know and uh homage to to Jacques I think he did a lot of work on this and that was something that he brought up that he personally experienced a lot of times in his um professional life as well as how cost prohibitive this was for people and and uh anything we can do to kind of uh, um help make things more streamlined more efficient less costly less onerous and and the the biggest part with all that too I think um, from my perspective, the uncertainty that people face when they're, when they're trying to go through that, when they're making those expenditures too, um, I, I, I think can, can be really rewarding. And it is the, 
little lion fruit that just sits there because like Terry was saying, infrastructure is everything. And the, the notion that we're increasing the opportunity for housing and in a way where we can even, you know, we, we had that discussion about rent control before. So one of the things it's really hard to just generically impose rent control restrictions, but when you're providing allowances, that's where you can put in things like, you know, AMI restrictions, whatever else it may be, local workforce housing, that's the ticket to do all those things. And, um, you know, the countervailing notion of, I don't want too many houses by me, I, I think is really outweighed by all the benefit that we can face there. And so I think ADUs, um, it also provides, I think in terms of middle income housing, which, you know, is a, a big thing that, that, you know, we've talked about here um, and a big thing that we're trying to focus on, it, it is a mechanism that can uh, provide people who are, you know, in that middle income bracket the opportunity to stay and to afford to be able to stay in Boulder as well, because it's the way they can revenue stream it, especially over time, especially if their costs up front aren't too high. And we had a lot of this conversation regarding uh, tiny homes. And I think this is just a, a cousin to those conversations and anything we can do to support and help encourage that, I, I'm 100% behind. Thank you, Danny. Um, Julianne has a hand up, please. Hey. Philip is up first. If you want to go, Philip, and I'll go. No, Philip's already talked. Let's have you go first. Then oh, Philip. okay, fine. Um, I was wondering if anyone could briefly explain what the current process of setting up an ADU is, because I talked to someone recently, and she was like, "Well, I have this perfectly suitable unit above my garage, but it's just not worth going through the process and um of doing that." And I just I haven't done my own research yet on that, on how that is done but based on what i do know about adus i don't see why we don't just like even create incentives for homeowners to create adus and add affordable housing to the city i'm sure people have their reasons as to why we don't want that but um yeah i'm just curious as to what that process is i guess that's a great question because i have an adu and i don't understand the process so i'm hoping that we're, <laughs> we're, <laughs> I'm hoping that our staff liaisons will be able to explain what the heck is going on. Yeah. Um, so basically, the accessory dwelling unit is um, it, it needs to go through a permitting process, just like you would need to for, to build a house. It has to comply with all the regulations, all the front setbacks, side setbacks, the solar re requirements, so you're not shading your neighbors, um, compatible development standards. Um, but on top of that, there's also um, a land use review. So that what I just described is the permitting. There's also a land use review that you have to go through. And it costs $450, um, which actually is pretty cheap compared to a lot of other jurisdictions. Um, but that, it can take several months. And what they do is that you have to meet all of the criteria in the code. Um, so you have to basically, um, you make sure that there's a, you meet the minimum lot size, that you meet all these other requirements. Um, if you're in a certain zone, if there's um, an ADU close to you, you may not be able to build one. Um, so they go through a process. They also notify all the neighbors that you want to have build an ADU. Um, and the neighbors are given a window of opportunity to provide comments. Um, you don't have to listen to them, but um, at least they can share their concerns. Uh, and so overall, you know, it's difficult to say. Um, a lot of what we hear is uh, some people have, are challenged going through the process because our permitting process is not easy. Um, often you have to hire a professional. Um, Jacques could tell you a lot more about his experiences um, in going through the process because he's built ADUs for clients uh, all over the city. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a bit of an ordeal um, but it's done to protect basically the neighbors and the neighborhood to make sure that that um, unit is built in a way that's sensitive to the neighborhood. Um, because our, our whole goal with the ADUs, it's, it's sort of this unseen infill, right? So uh, you walk by a house with an ADU, you don't even know it's there. Um, and we want to make, make sure it stays that way. So the, the challenge is how do you balance the right amount of regulation versus um, encouraging people? And I would say there are other incentives. So obviously, I, this was my project back in 2018, so I could talk about this for hours, but I think Boulder has done a really good job in the sense that um, we don't charge enormous tap fees. 
Um, basically, you use the same tap as the main house, uh, same thing with electricity, um, everything else. Um, some challenges, you, it doesn't need, if it's detached, it needs to be sprinkled. Um, and that adds expense, sometimes as much as $10,000. Anyway, I mean, I could go on and on, but it just gives you a flavor of sort of what the regulations are and, and why they're in place. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, before we go to Jennifer, did you mention the parking? I'm sorry, I need to check to see if I turn my sprinkler off. Uh, did you mention the parking requirements? Yeah, so it depends. <coughs> so that, that was a, a huge challenge prior to the update. Um, so we, uh, we, we did change that so that you can provide off street parking. Um, it doesn't have to be paved. Um, and we can also, we also waive it if you agree to, um, a declaration of use that re restricts rents to 80% of AMI. So you can get it that way. You can also get a, a larger EDU if you restrict your rent. So their council was really in, uh, intent on building incentives into the program. Um, but they left certain things in place, like the saturation limit, um, because of concerns primarily on the hill um, of single family homeowners concerned that um, more and more homes were going to get converted to multifamily. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think it's Jen's turn to comment. Hey, uh, quickly, is the uh, are we talking about ADUs as we were speak? We spoke about them in previous meetings. With Jacques, we're we talking about ADUs with pads. No, we're talking about in general uh, all, all kinds of ADUs, but primarily oh, okay. buildings. Yeah, and how to encourage more people to either build them or convert uh, more uh, a portion of their home to them if they have a part of their house that would work with that. And Jennifer, I'd say probably it includes those tiny homes with the pads, like we talked about, because that's that's part of the aid. It's a subset of ADUs. But ADUs stretch, you know, much further than that. So I think we're talking about just the whole notion of any and all types of ADUs that that might potentially be viable. Great. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Philip, you had another comment. I have a question. Um, is uh, our um, ADUs and occupancy limits uh, closely related? When I when I was on. Uh, working with bedrooms there for people. I think I think the understanding was that um, an ADU doesn't change the occupancy restrictions of a property. So, like, um, is that true? And and if so, uh, do we need to make recommendations about um, loosening occupancy restrictions? Because if if it doesn't if it doesn't change the basic um, uh, configuration of what's allowed on a property, then to me, ADU seemed kind of like a moot point. Um, and so I would think that that needs to be addressed hand in hand with um, occupancy restriction reform. Yeah, yeah Phil, um, so council did modify the occupancy standards specifically for ADUs. So um, basically you can have two independent families um, and all their dependents and their dependents don't count towards the occupancy limit. Um, so the, that was one of the big things that we, what, the reason why it took seven council readings was that uh, language uh, nailed down. So basically um, people are, yeah, basically it just expanded and it's significantly more expanded than pretty much any other um, situation in the city. That's wonderful. And I'm going to expose my ignorance at every turn. So uh, thank you for no, filling me. That's great. We're all here to learn as much as anything else. So don't feel at all uh, uh, worried about that, Bill. Uh, ask lots of questions. Um, Jen, I think you had your hand up again. Yeah, I do. I can't move on. I'm sorry. That's okay. uh, I need to know more about what are the incentives for people um, to even start the process for an ADU? Like, what does that look like? Because I'm hearing... Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand like who's within the financial reach to spend first of all the time um, and then possibly to contract a professional to like just deal with the paperwork and you know with the pads we talked about that expense being around ten thousand um, dollars and then <laughs> then to throw on another two hundred thousand dollars for like an ADU unit itself just seems like I'm trying to understand 
like who we're benefiting with this um, and what that looks like. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's one of the big hangups with ADUs. Um, you know, construction in Boulder now is pegged to at least $400 a square foot. And even to make a four or 500 square foot studio, ADU is quite expensive. So what's the payback uh, at, a, at a market rate, which you might call attainable or affordable? It's, it actually doesn't work for a lot of people. I mentioned in my memo that Denver is experimenting with subsidizing um, ADUs for homeowners, I think with zero interest loans. And uh, they've just uh, dedicated their first one last week. So, you know, that's something we could look at. Um, uh, again, I think uh, in my personal experience was it was not expensive to convert an existing room in our home because it already had a bathroom, for example, uh, to an ADU. And it's been, you know, a really short uh, term payoff for us and has provided housing for young professionals in their 20s who are making roughly 40,000 a year. So that's the kind of win win I think we're looking for with the ADU program. It's not that easy to achieve. Um, before we go to Philip, I'll just mention that uh, if we were to make a recommendation on AUs, and we should spend more time talking about it, that it should be more specific. It wouldn't be the 30,000 feet of planning reward reserve. I think council is looking for a more specific direction on this topic. Um, and, uh, you know, that's going to take some more conversation. Philip, please. Oh, I just... Um, just to kind of follow up on your point about your ADU, um, there's a lot of near ADUs in town, right, uh, where the house is um, missing a full kitchen, you know, where it has a hot plate and a sink, you know, but um, so not all ADUs have to start from from scratch from ground zero. Um, and so, so some some could be actually very inexpensive to, to bring online. Yeah, interesting point. Um, to, to Jay's point about why some might be squeamish at ADUs, there is, there is a fair amount of regulatory oversight. For example, uh, we couldn't rent out if we wanted to go spend a year in Spain, which I would like to do. Um, we couldn't rent out our house and also have the ADU rental. It has to be an owner-occupied house with an ADU. So I think that is a bit of a fail-safe for those who might be concerned that ADUs will somehow create a landslide toward you know, losing uh, the character of single family neighborhoods. And Danny, you got your hand up. Yeah, I, um, my thought is, uh, Michael, kind of pairing off of what you were saying that this this could be, you know, and I, I guess it's one of those things whenever, you know, we've talked about the notion of having listen sessions whenever we go back to live meetings, but this could be a really good topic for a listening session, I would think, because, you know, there's the perspective of people in the neighborhoods that, you know, maybe pro, maybe con with this whole thing. But I mean, just to get that kind of direct input in terms of how it could help people and stuff like that and the people that want it and some of the challenges that they face, I just think it could be a really useful listen session. And I think it's something that before we make any recommendations to council, I agree, you know, that we, we've already pretty well indicated from the 30,000 foot level that we're supportive of them. I, th I think all the tiny homework certainly underscores mm -hmm. that point. But um, in terms of what else we could do, you know, this could be one of the larger things that, you know, um, we could put on our agenda, I think, for this yeah. next year or so. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and we could also do a broad brush uh, just to put the idea out there and say, you know, we support the idea of legalizing ADUs everywhere with uh, all the usual uh, regulatory bumper guards around shadowing and parking and and uh, occupancy and, and so forth. Um, but I have a thing, we, we probably need to spend some time and get a little more fine grain on this one. Yeah. Uh, let's see, does someone else have their hand up? Um, well, I think again, uh, this could be a more specific agenda item for May. And we can talk about how we wanna tease out our recommendation about ADUs, whether we want to form a subcommittee, for example, uh, uh, schedule a listening session or do something else. I think having somebody explain the economics of, 
uh, to Jennifer's point of how the ADU works. Michael, I don't know if you're, uh, you've got a permanently affordable ADU and that's why, if, if that's why you can't um, rent it out if you were to go away, that it has to be owner, your home has to be owner occupied. Um, I know there's some restrictions about permanently affordable ADUs and then market rate ADUs and there that there creates um, uh, deed restrictions on on the property and I think getting uh, having somebody explain the economics if you've got a 400 square foot ADU and you can charge fifteen hundred dollars in rent or if that's what the market might command uh, in the rest of Boulder and you're investing two hundred thousand dollars then your payback is somewhere if I do the math quickly around eleven years so someone's um, investment would pay off in a rent rental income over an eleven year period of time. Again, I just did quick math in my head there, but I think to Jennifer's point, like the economics need to be understood of where are the benefits. And then you, it's a capitalist system. We can't force people to build ADUs to rent. Some people build ADUs because they want to have a quote unquote mother-in-law apartment, or they want to have friends to be able to come visit. So there's that issue too, that um, is, is just a, a dynamic that exists um, the way our country is structured. Yeah, I agree. And uh, full transparency, our ADU is not deed restricted or affordable, but we have not raised the rent in five years. So, you know, we're, we feel like we're making some money from it and somebody else is benefiting it with probably below market rate rent. Um, there are cities that have ADUs everywhere. DC is the one that's always brought up. Uh, the homes are actually designed around that largely, the row homes with English basements. Um, you know, it does again, it doesn't mean everybody has to do it and there would be no point in trying to force that. But if we could get, see an increase in the supply of ADUs, it seems like that would be a win. If it's hundreds of, of them, that's, that's a lot of people who get housing. So Michael, I'm, I'd be happy um, if you guys pick a month or a meeting, um, spend, I don't know, 20 minutes going over sort of what is the existing regulatory structure, a little bit of history of ADUs in Boulder. So, I mean, I would just basically, um, you know, dig out all the stuff that we presented to council back in 2018 um, and share that with the group. Um, HAB, that was actually one of their first recommendations. I'm trying to think if anyone has left on HAB for that original recommendation to council in 2018. Danny, were you around? I don't think so. You're muted. I wasn't, yeah, it was right before me. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'm happy to do that because yeah, none of you have, have heard all this stuff before. So I, I'd love to do that next month. I think that could be a good agenda item for next month. Um, I agree with that. Does anyone disagree? Okay, sure. nothing we need to vote on. Let's move on to the next topic then, um, Transit Village. Um, you know, it's, uh, as someone referenced, it's still a somewhat early phase of development, although a lot of it has been built. Um, there are challenges there. Uh, lack of transit is one of them. Uh, there are some motiv motivated property owners who would love to develop more housing there. I feel like they've been held back for whatever reason. And um, there have also been some movement towards a build out at least of adjacent areas like Spark 30 Pearl is really an interesting one because that was very much driven by a city purchase of property um, from, what 15 years ago, which is now coming to fruition. And um, uh, yeah, let's just open it up for discussion. I don't have a specific recommendation on this, just want to talk about it and see what you folks think. Philip? Um, I think one of the things that um, I, I mentioned before about the East, oh, I didn't know this was in an email thread, I'm sorry. Um, the thing I want to say is um, one of my concerns about the, um, the, the transit village, Boulder Junction, is uh, whether or not it's, a, it's like a pro-social community building kind of environment. Um, 
the, the buildings look nice. They look a little sterile. Uh, they look kind of uniform. I, I haven't spent a lot of time there, so I don't know what the vibe is. Um, but I, I just wonder, you know, like, like um, you know, one of the reasons I'm passionate about housing, it's not, it's not just because of the affordability issue, which is number one for me, but also like I want to have beautiful places to live that have strong social connections. And um, I just wonder if there's, you know, if there's any anecdotal evidence that we've built a, a, a neighborhood that's like highly socially connected or, or, you know, fosters, you know, serendipitous interactions with people who are walking past each other. And, um, and if we have, then we should, we should uh, announce that and, and make it known and, sit and say what a great job we did. If, if we haven't, we should maybe analyze what's going on in that neighborhood and, and think about ways to tweak it or adjust it so that we do have those kinds of beautiful places. Thank you, Philip. Danny? Um, yeah, I appreciate all those comments, Philip, because I, I, I agree with that. I guess my, my thing with the transit village, and, and this goes to the uh, to Bob's top 10 memo too that you attached, Michael. I just, I'm not sure what they want to do with it. So it's hard for me to speak to what we should do with it, right? I mean, are they looking to re uh, kind of reanalyze it and repurpose it? Or are they just saying, what can we do to make it better? I'm, I, it seems to be a really, I'm really unclear in terms of what we could do there. And I guess that's my, that's my initial concern. Okay. Um, well, I'll, from the hip, address some of Philip's comments. Uh, I have hung out there just to see what it's like. And, um, you know, it doesn't feel like a great urban neighborhood, but there are some bones there. There have been streetscape improvements. It's kind of interesting to go there in a warm day and see people walking around in bathing suits because the apartments have pools and, you know, you get some of that kind of social vibe going. The retail is, is pretty weak. Um, it, it, you know, it's not going to remind you of East Pearl or any place you like to go downtown. That could be a critical mass issue. And, uh, you know, the design of the buildings has been like a real whipping person for uh, folks that you know, don't like denser development in Boulder. And that criticism is, uh, you know, there's, it's not totally invalid. There's some pretty ho-hum architecture and placemaking there. But I think the more recent additions like Boulder Commons and Spark have shown some improvement in that respect. Um, a lot of the development, the early development was really market rate apartments. Uh, there's been more townhomes added in lately. I have no idea the demographics of people moving in there. I've seen definite improvement in the streetscapes. Um, but I've heard from folks that own some of the property is they would, you know, they would like to move forward with redevelopment and add more housing and they feel like they need more encouragement from the city. Um, how that translates into a recommendation from HAB, I don't have any idea of yet, but I think it's worth talking about. Michael, <clears throat> can I weigh in? Hello, who was speaking? Hello, Michael? Yeah. Michael Terry. Um, oh, Terry. The, I think the ship is, pretty much sailed when it comes to the transit village. I mean, the great majority of it's built. I mean, yeah, there's still some to be built, but the lion's share of it is there and it's established. Um, and with the last, you know, the rest of the po old former Pollard site being under construction and built now and the rev done, I mean, it's, it's what you see is what you get there. I mean, there's not a lot of change. I mean, what's left a little bit on 30th as you go north across from steel yards, you know, there's not a ton to, to, to create. It's created. It's there. Um, that's that's my thought. Um, whether it's good or not, I mean, I'm an old Boulder guy, and that's nothing that of what I would thought Boulder to be. But if you look at everything that's written in words about what you want to create, what we want to create, it's all there. You can walk out your front door on any number of different types of living situations, townhomes, apartments, condos, you name it, and, and walk across the street to get food, coffee, get your hair done, go to work, uh, recreational areas on the second floor with the pools. I mean, it's all there. Density, rooftop decks, great views. Um, I mean, retail's across the street, basically. 29th Street's the retail for the most part. 
you know, I, I do agree that the, the Spark or the Rev deal, I mean, the retail is a little weak. Retail is a bad word in the world right now, you know, brick and mortar retail. So it's not so much that project as it is the whole country's retail brick and mortar is, is hard right now. But when I walk around there and I spend some time there and, and, you know, underground parking, so you don't see the cars on the surface, buildings up on the streets, everything that you can write down in theory about what you want things to be is there. But for me, when I walk around there, I just don't feel it. I, I don't feel it. I don't know how else to say it. You have big, dense buildings, bulky. Some of the architecture is phenomenal, I think. Some of it's really bad. Um, but that's kind of how everything is when it comes to building things. Architecture is such a personal preference, you know. Um, but, but I don't, from a back, with all that said, from a HAB perspective, I don't know how much influence we really have. I mean, the transit village's development's there. The, the plan is there. You know, are we looking to, to modify the rules for the remaining half a dozen parcels of land? Is that what we're trying to do? To make them different, you know, to kind of fill the gaps? I don't know. I, I just don't know what our role is in the transit village, given that that thing was vetted, neighborhood meetings for years and years and years. And now it's, it's built out. I mean, it's there. What you see is... is what we went through in subcommittee meetings and all that stuff and neighborhood meetings and all that for years and years and years. So I, I guess what I'm missing is what's our role in trying to influence it at this point. Great. Uh, those are good comments. So um, uh, two things. Um, there is quite a bit to be built out if you go all the way to Foothill Parkway. And I'll just uh, just read the council comments as summarized by uh, Bob Yates. Uh, it's, about, it's all about TDAP too. Um, uh, areas west of the train tracks and along North Area Street. Uh, there are no definitive plans yet for business or housing in TBAP too, but council wants to at least launch the community engagement around fulfilling the vision of the plan developed and approved 15 years ago. So I guess that might suggest a spot for comment. Um, we could also decide what the heck it's not something we're going to have an influence on, but it seems like that's a, a still a big, pretty big chunk of land. Uh, and um, it's still up in the air and which way it's going to go. Jen, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, I had friends that live over in this area. Um, I've been over there and um, not just to visit them, but I used to hang out over there. Um, my feelings on, I agree with uh, Terry. I mean, it is kind of what it is. Um, and what it is to me is um, it's not seamless. It, uh, to me, it feels like it missed the mark. Um, to me, it seems super fragmented. So you've got some communities, like some apartments that you have to basically need like a treasure map to find, go down these like little side streets. Um, and so I just don't, and then you've got like empty lots next to, um, you know, new development, maybe they're building, maybe they're not, just seems, yeah, it seems really choppy to me. Um, and I, when I think of, when I think of like walkability and I think of communities, I think of, I think of a, that area, um, kind of all looks the same. There's no real character there. Um, the buildings to me all look the same. Uh, so, I mean, I guess that's real. Those are really my comments. And then the other thing that I had emailed in about is, you know, I understand the cost effectiveness of using the, the wood frames, but I mean, we have higher, more and more wildfires happening. And I'm like really concerned about my friends that live in 30 Pearl and other apartment <laughs> buildings. Um, if I just wanted to state that, thank you. Danny. Oh, you're muted, Danny. Yeah, sorry. I guess the one thing, you know, uh, which, which you noted in your memo, Michael, is the, the whole it's it's called like transit village or whatever and and there's really a, a lack of transit there too and so i mean maybe the whole notion of saying you know let's address the fact you know there's no b line rtd's kind of forgotten about it um 
you know, like Tyra was saying, brick and mortar retail is, is, you know, monumentally changed and, and we don't even know, you know, how that's going to play out over time. And, and maybe from those things, you know, we're, we're happy to play a role in, in trying to um, figure out a vision for how to either, you know, see it through or repurpose it and, and something along those lines, maybe, maybe just with that sort of generality. I think there's something to be said for readdressing it, but I just, you know, again, I think the tone's been set for it and it's kind of hard that sort of saying before it's hard to, you know, change course, but to the extent that we do, I think we just say we'd love some guidance on that. And if that's, you know, something we can help with, maybe that leaving it at that is a good way of addressing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does almost suggest that, you know, maybe the future planning is not around transit, <laughs> the whole idea of a high density district, much as I'm often in favor of that, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense if it's not going to be served by uh, regional transit or local transit. All right. I mean, I, I love transit area development, but I think the the key term in that in that title is transit, right? Because right. if you don't have transit, then it kind of takes away from the whole notion of transit area development. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can I share um, a map of the area? I think that Absolutely. might clarify things a little bit for folks. Let's see if I can pull it up. Uh, no, wrong one. Hold on. I have a very quick comment in the meantime. Um, I just, sure. in, one thing in defense of, of uh, transit, so to speak, uh, of, of Boulder Junction is that bike path that goes from uh, the Googleplex uh, to the to the east side of the neighborhood is is very nice and uh, I, I I it's it's a part of my route making you know plans now and, and uh, so I, that that's my favorite thing about the uh, about the neighborhood is they they did a good job with the um, the connections uh, and you can you can get up to Goose Creek pretty easily on the street and it doesn't feel dangerous. Uh, too so there's two north north south east and west both both seem to work for me. Anyways. Yeah, so I, thanks, Philip. And, and I would just say, you know, it's still a fairly nascent community. So um, you really need those people to move in and, and be part of building that community and what you got hope to see out there. But just to clarify, so phase one is pretty much 90% built out. So it's this here's Pearl Parkway, it's the block to the south. Here's the railroad tracks, uh, Valmont 30th. So when, when council's talking about phase two, they're talking about this stretch on the other side of 30th, and then this whole area um, west of the railroad tracks, or I mean, east of the road tracks, sorry. Um, and that is primarily uh, industrial right now. So although there's a vision for it and a plan um, in TVAP, uh, the city didn't pull the trigger basically on changing the zoning um, to enable that vision to happen. So there, I think that's what they're talking about in terms of a planning process to figure out, all right, is that the right vision for the rest of the area to continue that, um, what we're seeing at, as part of phase one. Does, is that helpful? And is that your understanding, Michael, or? Yeah, yeah, and uh, thank you for, Verifying my statement, which I sort of, sort of made up, that uh, there is still a lot of developable land in the transit village, <laughs> the Boulder Junction, and uh, you know the idea of rezoning could be our sweet spot for making a recommendation. Uh, we just have to decide when the right time to do that would be. But it, it, it's similar to Area Three, I would argue, because um, there has to be a whole community process around it. Mm -hmm. I will be involved in that, um, but I'm not. I'm, it's not clear to me what Hab's role um, until that community engagement process is kicked off. Right. So um, maybe it's maybe it's one recommendation, like get the ball rolling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in both of those ways. Okay, that's really helpful. That map is. is very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, and, and the piece about transit too. I mean, keep in mind, we're talking 30, 50 years and we better have a light rail out to Boulder yeah. 30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, we don't. Well, Jay, Jay, RTD is not going to exist anymore. I can guarantee Jay, that. It'll be 92. <laughs> Jay, you remember the light rail idea of coming through there, but you couldn't, one small problem that nobody thought of, you can't get on and off of it where they thought you could get on and off of it. Well, wasn't that the major problem that they had to move the station? Yeah. We, 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 where we decide whether the power site where you could you know load and unload uh, you actually couldn't do that there <laughs> small problem small the, problem. Uh, this is an aside but there's a very good podcast available for free from cpr called ghost train that talks quite a bit about um the uh evolution of fast the creation of fast tracks the evolution of fast tracks the early thinking of transitory development and uh, all the reasons that there is not a train stopping in uh, Boulder now and not projected for another 25 years or whatever it is. Uh, it's Which really is well the done. most ridiculous thing ever. How can there be a train going from Boulder to Denver? How go, is that possible? Go listen to Ghost Train. You that is so car unbelievable. And, to to <laughs> and it's been paid for already by all of us. <laughs> we've been paid. Yeah, we've paid for it. You got it. It's not it. there. Not there. How yeah. is that unearthly possible? <laughs> well, that issue is addressed directly in, in, in evenly in, in Ghost Train. I really do recommend it. It's great background. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Michael. That's what to do. And I appreciate, I would, I would guess the, the purpose of this board is to talk about getting more housing produced, but I really appreciate the fact that you're all well-rounded people and we can talk about placemaking and transit and all the other things that, and schools and all the other things that make a community because just building housing is not the answer. It has to be done done well. Um, I personally am ready to move on to item eight unless anyone would like any more discussion about this. I think this has been really productive. Thank you for your comments. Let's do it. Okay, item eight, we get to turn it over to a staff Sorry, Michael. by Jay. Michael, can I go back? Oh, sure. I'm sorry to backtrack, but um, so yeah. is there a next step for the um, station area? I mean, TVAP two, phase two? Like, do you want to talk about that more or? Uh, again, is I think similar to the planning reserve, we should put it on the agenda to develop a, a recommendation if we're ready to make one um, at a pretty high, you know, 30,000 foot plane. Uh, let's do it, but let's give ourselves another month to think about it. Okay, I'll combine that with uh, Area 3 planning reserve. I think it could be one recommendation, yeah, simplify it. Okay. Unless anyone wants to vote on it tonight. Nope, didn't think so. <laughs> Took a big risk. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, Jay, thank you. Um, and I'm up next, right? You are. Can I can I backtrack one more time, real quick? Yes. Um, I I think the purpose of our last agenda was open discussion for any of the seven items, but you had kind of highlighted five and then three of the five that you thought were appropriate because if they address middle income, um, is there going to be a time or a, a, are we going to uh, you know? talk about any of the other ones or because um, there, there's at least one in there that I'm kind of really passionate yeah. about. I think we're well ahead of schedule and I'm certainly, I mean, I didn't put those three out as uh, biblical tablets. So sure, let's talk about it. Yeah, so um, there's a paragraph in Bob Yates's um, memo about titled density and parking. And um, I'm I'm not sure what the the whole context of that of that discussion was, and maybe what they actually had in mind in terms of like likely policy directions that might come out of that. But um, one one of the things that I'm kind of obsessed with is the notion of a of a pilot or some neighborhood that that tackles um, car light living in a meaningful way. Uh, with respect to um, sharing cars, having very little parking. And um, I, would, I would love to explore possible neighborhoods or possible developments that, um, that uh, you know, just, just as a, maybe it's just a visionary kind of a thing, but um, 
we have a climate crisis and our housing is related to the climate. Um, not, not only in the fact that um, we, have, we have all this sprawl happening at the, at the wildlife, uh, uh, you know, the rural urban edge, you know, um, which increases lots of, uh, increases the, the vehicle miles traveled and all that. Um, but um, we also, even in Boulder, which is dense by Colorado standards, is, uh, is just sort of handed over to cars and we don't really make it easy or um, uh, uh, compelling, um, you know, irresistible for people to live without cars in Boulder. And so I just, I just feel like um, this whole notion of density and parking, uh, despite the fact that like, I didn't, I didn't hear the broader conversation. It, for me, it just triggers this this thing about um, it, are, are there are there projects that we can propose? Or are there outlets that for discussion in this in Hab, where we can explore um, ways to make it irresistible for people to give up their cars so that we can save the planet? No, it's a great um, comment. There are there was a really interesting New York Times article about Portland. In the Sunday Times, and Portland has been the big city, medium-sized city leader in prioritizing bicycles and pedestrians and transit over cars. And they're now reaching this point of contention around that. Of yeah, we got this dense core where you can live without a car if you're a rich white person, but everyone else is in neighborhoods that uh, are lower income that rely on cars for people to get to work and. So forth and they don't have sidewalks they don't have the bicycle infrastructure so it's, it's kind of been raised as an equity issue it's really interesting it's happening in denver too um, there are a few developments around the world that are car light or car free and it would be really interesting to highlight that for boulder um and actually actually get someone to pilot it um i'm not quite sure how our type of board gets that conversation going but it's really an important discussion Danny, and then Julianne. What I would say is I think that, you know, I really appreciate those comments and I think it's absolutely correct. My, my concern has always been about the fact that transit, I grew up in, in New York, transit is horrible in Colorado in general and certainly around Boulder. And we just talked about the whole issue with the fact that we still don't have a light rail and we were just talking about the transit center. But I, I think it would be... Uh, interesting thing for us to, if there's some way to have this on some future agenda item where we just talk about the whole notion of what, you know, changing around, you know, and, the, and since it did come from, from this, you know, from, from Bob's top 10 memo there, changing that, what the implications would be in terms of making housing more attainable if we changed around some of the concepts regarding density restrictions, which certainly cause a lot of this, and then and then um parking as well um you know understanding that you know there needs to be transit to go to a carless community but there's still you know if we're looking 10 20 years down the future i think it could be helpful to have some sort of uh agenda item where we talk about that or at least you know stimulate some conversation on that um as something that we're paying attention to too because it does absolutely relate to attainable housing in a lot of ways Thank you, Julianne. Mm, I actually didn't have my hand raised. I was just fidgeting, but thanks anyway. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's it's embedded in Boulder's ambitions and to some extent in policies, you know, let's have 15 minute neighborhoods, let's have a carbon neutral city. Again, my question, it's an open one is, how do we bring these concepts to the attention of the decision makers? What kind of information and case studies can we provide, and uh, you know, how do we do that? As our in our role as an advisory board, where we're, you know, primarily commenting on the policy direction. So um, I don't know. Maybe we should uh, do a do a session just on fifteen minute neighborhoods and how can we can, how can we achieve them with balanced attainable housing? And yeah, here's what I I, I think. Um, but I can't remember the guy who came and talked about tiny housing at first. He was the, uh, the veteran and he was doing that project, um, I think up in Longmont. Um, 
if there's somebody that, you know, some, some, some group that would be interested in presenting on that, I mean, that would just be a good start because I mean, it's, it's, it's awfully nebulous right now, but you know, um, I think having those initial conversations on tiny housing helped uh, develop a lot of policy and, and insight and stuff like that for this board and, and um, hopefully for the community. So maybe that, maybe it's just something as simple as that. Um, Cause I don't know, I, I don't know that a listening session on that, um, it just seems to be like it would be unruly to me. Um, and yeah. in a way where there's not really some direction, you know, ADUs, it's like, what do we need to do with those? You know, that issue is a little, maybe a little too open-ended, but certainly we have time on the agenda to have, you know, half hour, hour, whatever it is, have somebody come and do, or, you know, a couple of entities come do presentations on that might be nice. Yeah. I've certainly heard, heard good presentations that are analytical and fact based about, you know, like what, what do certain housing densities and urban formats with access to transit mean for vehicle miles traveled, um, uh, the amount of money that households put towards uh, transportation versus paying for their basic housing needs. I mean, there is some some really good construction costs for and new and data, and data around that. Maybe it's pre-COVID. Maybe it needs to be updated. But um, you know, we could find someone to talk to us about that and inform us and try to share that knowledge. Can I just add what you're describing? I would say the city has, has um, piloted this at Alpine Balsam. So the fact that we, you know, it's going to have district energy, all the parking is shared, unbundled, um, paid for, high level of affordable housing, we adopted a form-based code for it, um, which emphasizes sort of design around the pedestrian as opposed to the automobile. Um, providing mobility hubs. So, I mean, it, it, same thing with 30 Pearl. So, you know, that's a project that's already built and that's kind of the model as well with the form-based code. So um, it, it's a lot easier when it's the city that owns the land and has a lot more control. Um, but we're using those as demonstrations to try to show that there is a different path forward. We don't have to follow the traditional development model. I just wanted to share. Would there be interest in bringing in a guest speaker for a future meeting, near future meeting, to say, you know, here's the difference in mode splits based on urban form for places that are actually, you know, have been built and have some history and longitudinal knowledge? I think I I think it would be great. I mean, even and you know, if we don't have to look any further than, you know, projects within the city, maybe have somebody from the city come and talk about that. I mean, it could be a good starting point. I can't hurt. I'll bring some suggestions to the next meeting for your consideration. Thank you, Philip. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, any other those items that anyone wants to discuss before we move on to item eight? Okay, uh, matters from the staff. Jay has been chomping at the bit to present this, so we're going to turn it over to him. You're on mute. Yep, now I figured that out. Um, yeah, I can do that. Uh, I just have a couple of things I wanted to share before um, we talked about the dashboard. Um, so the first one is planning board is meeting tomorrow night and hopefully appoint a new liaison. So hopefully next for our next meeting, we'll have a, someone from planning board join us. Um, I can't guarantee that, but um, that's the hope. And then I also just got word today that um, this board will have the option to return in person for the June meeting. So um, what I need to know from the board is if that is uh, desirable. Um, so the option is stay completely remote or move to in-person hybrid. So that means, uh, and I clarified this today, um, that you still have the option of participating remotely. Um, if you're not comfortable being there in person or you know, for whatever reason. So we just need to give 
feedback to um, our boards and commission staff uh, what direction this board would like to go. Yeah, Michael, you're muted too. Yeah, I've heard some boards, uh, the boards will meet in person, but the staff and the public will be virtual. Is, is there more than one permutation to that? Endless permutations. So yeah, I mean, theoretically, if you're there, some staff have to be there. Some, someone has to, you know, run the meeting for you. So we will likely, Tiffany and I will be there if it's in person. Um, but it's possible that if, they, that if you have a staff presenting, they might be remote. Okay, well, not to influence anyone else's personal decisions, but I'm totally comfortable with meeting in person. Jennifer has her hands range. I'd love to meet everyone in person, but for me personally, um, doing this from my home is it works better for my schedule. Thanks. Thank you. Let's go down the line. Julianne. I think it's a great idea. Um, would we meet in the council chambers? Yeah, exactly. That sounds like fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I also a like party. the... A big huh? party. It's a big party. <laughs> it sounds great. Um, yeah. Bring a little briefcase. No, but it sounds like a good idea. I like the hybrid option too. Keep people comfortable. You'll have a nameplate and everything. Ha. Wow. <laughs> Uh, Philip, what do you think? I was going to make a joke about a nameplate. Like, can I get a nameplate? <laughs> <laughs> joke? I thought that would be funny, not a serious uh, request. Everyone will. Ha everyone already, I believe, has a nameplate, um, and we're getting uh, new ones ordered for our newest members. For fifteen dollars extra, it can be embossed with script. <laughs> Well, I'll show up. I'll show up just so I can sit behind my name. Wow. <laughs> Terry, what do you think? Terry, what's your opinion? Your I'm up. Uh, me in person or would you stay virtual? Oh, in person, 100%, man. 100% in person. I don't ever want to look at anybody else on a screen ever again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you feel the same. Some of us. No. Nor do I want to look at myself on a screen on this upper right <laughs> thing here. I don't want to look at myself anymore at all. That's the, that's the painful part. <laughs> Danny, I I think I think it's great. I'm like if I could get a name chain, that would be awesome. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think it's great. I mean, I just know. Uh, yeah, on the hybrid. We don't have the budget for the chain. Sorry. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll just go script then. Um, I think I think it's time. I think it can really help uh, us effectuate a lot of the things we're trying to do here. And uh, hybrid's great. You know, it gives people the option, gives them the flexibility or whatever. But, uh, you know, I think it's time. Um, you know, we got to get on with it. So I'm 100% in support of it. Great. And Jennifer being virtual means her cat can continue to attend. So that's actually a plus. Yeah. Uh, Juliet. I think having the hybrid option is great because I think we're going to continue to see uh, surges and varying levels of comfort with uh, being um, in public. I, I personally have an immune compromised uh, person in my life, so I have to be extra careful. And um, but I do think that uh, for the purposes of listening sessions, uh, those are really impossible to do with a with a, a group and, and they need to be done in person. So I like the, uh, the flexibility there. Great, and the, thank you. Um, so the public would have the right to attend in person for comments and to listen? Correct, they'd have the option of the yeah, remote or in person just like you would. Great, okay. Well, it sounds like most of us will be seeing each other in person in June. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is great, and I respect everyone's decision on this. And um, Jay, keep going. Yeah, and um, yeah, remember you get fed too. So we'll we'll resume meals, and you know, that's a great time for people to show up. 
you know, 15, 20, even 30 minutes in advance um, and just spend a little bit of time chatting. Oh, good. Before the formal meeting. So, all right. Um, I'll get on that. So the last thing I just wanted to uh, give you a quick tour of our updated um, dashboard. So it used to be in Tableau uh, and with the city moving everything towards Microsoft, we switched to Power BI. So in doing that, um, there was uh, quite a bit of data cleanup that we had to do actually. So um, the numbers have, have pivoted, changed slightly, but I just wanted to remind you that this is here. So this is on Boulder, um, uh, Boulder Measures, the website. City tries to track all the key indicators um, to tr see how well we're doing. Um, affordable housing, we have um, housing units and demographics. Uh, and one of the nice things about this is it's a bit interactive. So you can click on um, different data points and it will resort the rest of the data for you. So it's great. So if you want, so it tells you how many are home ownership versus rental. You can, you know, click on one of those, and it will tell you, um, you know, exactly what the percentage is. Uh, farther down, well, before I talk about the interactive stuff, let me just go through it really quickly. There's also a homelessness dashboard um, with lots of great information on um, homelessness that we've been tracking, shelter utilization. Um, and then there's also a community profile, which I'll talk about last. Um, so lots of information is out there. So if you're ever wondering how many units we have of permanently affordable housing, this is where you go, how we're doing towards meeting our goal. You know, right now we're at 8.1%. Um, shows our track over time. So it shows you how many units we had back in 1991, what that percentage was of the overall housing stock. Um, it shows you how many units were added each year. So both rental and affordable, or <laughs> rental and home ownership, yellow is home ownership. Each of those years, uh, it tells you the housing by type, uh, multifamily, condominium, single family, all the way down. It tells you number of bedrooms as well. Um, it's a little surprising how, just how many uh, three and four bedrooms we have and more. Um, their number of units uh, by um, income that, that is served by uh, the different um, affordable housing units. Uh, so the different income categories based on AMI. It also explains what AMI is. I think everybody here knows what it, what it is, but it also shows you the percentages, what the maximum in household income is associated with it. Shows you a map that um, hopefully will be interactive soon, but where all those units are um, how they're sort of distributed throughout the city um, and sort of how we classify all the different uh, permanently affordable units. So the bulk, of course, uh, new construction, but quite a few have been through acquisition. Um, a lot of those units were acquired and then had to be rehabilitated. Um, and then over time, we've also um, rehabilitated existing units. Those were mostly uh, public housing units. And then we have this um, strange category likely to remain affordable. And that just means it's owned by one of our affordable housing partners, um, like uh, um, uh, Golden West. So say uh, beds for seniors or older adults. So we don't necessarily have a covenant, but we know that they're owned and operated by um, a trusted partner and that they will remain affordable in the future. So any, any questions about what I just showed you? And then the interactive part is kind of fun too. So if you wanted to look at 2009 ownership units, um, it will modify all the other data to show you um, how many of those units were, you know, what were they? Were they multifamily? Like that year, there were 29 condominiums that were built. They'll tell you which incomes. So it was mostly moderate and middle, um, a couple low. Um, and then it eventually it'll show you the map as well. So you can basically click on any of this information and it will um, sort of filter the rest of the information for you. Any questions about all that? Go ahead, Danny. I, I just say, I think it's uh, great. I, I went around and messed around with it a little bit uh, previously and um, the interactive uh, aspect of it, I think is uh, phenomenal. There's so many, shitty government web pages out there and so i think this is something that really kind of 
you know, um, allows people to really dive into it. So I'm, I'm, uh, uh, very impressed and, and appreciate it. I think it's great. Anyone else have a question before I move on quickly? Julia? I think it's fantastic. Thank you. It's great to have all this data at our fingertips. And I'm sure it's great for you too, because you had to answer a lot of these questions over and over and over again <laughs> from various people. So Sounds thanks. Yep. Well, Thank you. How's your work? Yeah, very well done. Thank you. Can I, can I ask Jay, something? I'm sorry. I just had one more question. And do you, do you track this relative to other cities of our size and how we compare in terms of these achievements? Because I, I think to, I, I tend to think that we always, I mean, we always want to strive to do better, but when you look at this, you can, do you have a sense of how well Boulder has done vis-a-vis -vis other communities? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that would assume that other cities actually track their information the same way we do. <laughs> which isn't necessarily the case. Um, and it's taken us years to get to this point too. I mean, I've been working on this probably for five years now so that we can have decent data to be able to report and, and consistent. It used to change constantly. Like every year we'd have to go back and re-audit our data. And it was very, very time consuming. So, I mean, you have to be as a jurisdiction, you have to be really committed to it. And honestly, I've not seen other examples of other jurisdictions doing the same. So it, it's hard to compare. Uh, Phil? Yeah, is there, is there any chance there'll be a dashboard that has all for all housing, not just affordable housing? Um, yeah, I'll show you another dashboard in a minute. Um, it doesn't have the same amount of detail. Um, I also wanted to share the demographics page. So it's, it's a little bit buried, but up here you'll notice there's housing units and then there's another one for demographics. Um, and I think this is, this is the one that tells even a, a more powerful story. So it, it tries to humanize the, the units. So those units are homes, right? Um, and we have about 8,600 people uh, living in affordable housing. And if you put that in perspective, it's about one out of 12 residents in Boulder. So we're serving a fairly large segment of the population. And it just gives you some demographics on who they are, how much they earn, both for renters and for home ownership. Um, and, and this is really quite amazing. Just to, if you look at the rental stock that we have, um, just you know, half the people are earning between zero and 30% AMI. Um, and 31 to 60 is 41%. So that, to me, that is um, quite the accomplishment because if we just relied, for example, if we just relied on you know, inclusionary housing, all of those units would be built at 60% AMI. And from my perspective, the, the people that we're trying to serve are those lower um, incomes. Uh, it also gives you a sense of um, the occupation of those people um, living in those different groups. And then this one I think is the most fascinating, the, the race eth ethnicity. Um, and it just shows um, how with affordable housing, it increases the overall diversity of our city. So it compares who lives in affordable housing versus um, the city as a whole. Um, and that's about it. That's great, Jay. Uh, Question about that? Uh, when calculating the AMI, people who live in rental housing, um, does that take the student population to, into account? Well, the, the folks living in affordable housing. Oh, oh I'm sorry. This is just people living in yeah. affordable housing. Not all right. Okay. Apologies. But it does take into account um, the city as a whole when comparing it. Um, yeah. And I should have that answer for you. But um, how are students? Kind of, they are factored in, but it, it's, it's different somehow. And I, I don't know off the top of my head. I can't remember. Let me look that up and get back to you. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to make an unofficial proposal that uh, no one ever used the term housing unit again. We're really talking about homes here. And uh, that does help humanize the issue. So we don't need to vote on that. Just keep it in mind. Um, anything else on the uh, dashboard, either presentation or questions? Yeah. 
I have a question. I have a question slash request. Um, when I when when you bring up the notion of how many bedrooms are in each of these homes, um, I, I would I would just guess that there's not many um, three or four bedroom homes where uh, it's there's empty bedrooms. Um, and um, I also have a kind of working narrative around large homes in Boulder often being uh, underoccupied or, or mostly vacant. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just curious to know if you have data about bedrooms uh, for housing in, in general and, and the vacancy rates related to at the, at the bedroom level, you know, like uh, I, because it's, it just seems very common to have a very large house and have one or two people living there. And so I'd, I'd love to have some data around that. Yeah, um, so our um, the affordable housing, so basically you can't qualify for a two or a three or four bedroom home if you're only a single or person or a couple. So, you know. That, that's, that's my work. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I would say our, our vacancy of bedrooms is extremely low. Um, but the homeownership is a different story because the, you, you get preference for a larger home um, with more people in your household, but that can shift over time, right? So we don't require you to sell the home. So we don't have um, great data exactly in, on how many people are in it, but I think you can assume it's, it's significantly higher than the general population. And the other thing that we learned about that from the school district presentation was that, you know, the areas where um, affordable affordable housing has a significantly higher percentage of um, households with children and much higher school enrollment as well. So um, I thought that was really interesting as well. And then Philip, just to, to your previous question, um, this, you can see this, this is a community profile. Um, that's also updated annually um, that shows the overall population, square miles. Oh, this is where you can see the planning reserve, Philip. So it's that lighter green right there. Um, Area three planning reserve right there. Uh, shows you the city population, what the projected uh, population is going to be based on the last comp plan and, and the projections that were made. Same thing with employment. Um, shows you the affordable housing units. Um, this one I think is really interesting and then you'll see it updated with the new number for 2021, 20, uh, which is 1.25 million, I believe, for a single family home. Um, but just basically illustrates the difference between the, the growth of single family homes and attached homes as compared with income. Um, new housing units completed over time, attached versus detached. And then the statistic you mentioned earlier, Philip, 52% renters, vacancy rate, um jobs muting patterns as they change annually land use by zoning um and then uh top 10 employers as well as um new net new non-residential square footage <laughs> so anyway i just wanted to share all that information is out there it's tracked annually um and it's it's a, just a, a great resource so that's it any other questions Again, good work. Um, okay, if there are no other questions, we'll move over to move to item nine, which is to debrief the meeting. Um, I think we had a really productive meeting. Thank you all for our 100% attendance and for all your great comments. Um, looking ahead to May, um, I think we have a couple of possible agenda items. I just want to ground truth that with you. Uh, we think we might make a recommendation or at least start to uh, phrase a recommendation on uh, planning reserve and Boulder Junction, uh, possibly urging the city to move forward with the first steps in realizing some visions in those areas. Uh, we want a presentation, factual presentation on ADUs. Uh, what do the current policies say? Uh, what kind of um, numbers are we getting with ADUs? Has there been an increase in ADUs? since the last round of, of reform around those policies and uh, maybe some future directions for ADU uh, policy. Um, 
that we could shape into a future recommendation. And that would include all kinds of ADUs, attached, detached, and tiny homes on wheels. Um, we have discussed getting an update on the home ownership deed restriction program. Um, uh, how many homes do we have? What kind of price point? Um, how is that working? Uh, you know, there has been some uh, some static around that of late uh, related to, uh, you know, is it an equitable system and so forth. But I think for now, we're just looking for the information. And uh, I will bring some recommendations on a guest speaker and what we might call car light neighborhood design. See if there's something we can um, investigate further or shape a recommendation or a listening session around. Um, I'm sure I left some important future agenda items off, so please feel free to jump in or suggest. Okay. Um, anyone have something to add on the meeting debrief? Okay, calendar check our next meeting. Um, how does that sit with the Memorial Day schedule? Where, where, when would we be meeting? Uh, May 25th. Great, before Memorial Day. Um, and we run the Boulder Boulder. Um, I play in a garage band, the Howling Commandos, and we'll be at 20th and Glenwood, so wave when you go by. Uh, with that, uh, do I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second, shortest meeting ever, by the way. Uh, all in favor of adjourning. Thank you all and see you next month. And I will, uh, once we get our agenda, I will send out a, another note kind of prepping on um, what we might expect to do with that agenda if that's okay with everyone. So thank you again, appreciate the support for continuing to lead this board. And I think we have some good times ahead with political support for what we wanna do with housing. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.